I want to bring you guys here because um, you are in the world of business, you are in the world of small businesses, medium-sized businesses, whether you're in one or you're working with one or you're servicing some, um, and there's been a big push around employee empowerment. And there's been a big push around allowing our people to go off and innovate. You know, I, I fundamentally believe that we have trained an entire generation to like work on an assembly line, right? And I think that the world is changing. People are demanding better tools, better technologies, but more importantly, to like give me the freedom to, to, to do things. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if, if you've incorporated this within your businesses or what do you think about this, this movement to employee empowerment? Yeah, I think it's, it's necessary, right? I, I think at the end of the day, my job as you know, someone who's ho helping to lead different businesses in a, a huge, wide array of industries, none of which that I have deep personal experience in, the best job that I can do is hire people who are good at what they do, right? So I'm not an expert in childcare. We have the largest childcare company in the region. Um, I had to hire the best of the best and trust that she's gonna do what she's gonna do, right? Yeah. And empower her to, you know, with resources, tools, whatever she needs in order to accomplish those things. Same with the dry cleaning industry, oil and gas, real estate, whatever it is, I'm not an expert in any of those subject matters, so I have to trust the team that I'm putting in place. You know, breaking that traditional mold of how we look at work is really important, but freedom to me means building the autonomous worker. And so the autonomous worker starts to think about, you know, how do I have this idea of joy within the things that I do? Yeah. Um, how do I scale myself? How do I come to the table at that higher strategic level because I have input and impact? Um, and so to me, when we free up the worker, we're not micromanaging them, you know, they're not stuck in a box of the traditional nine to five, the talent from a creative aspect, especially being that we are creative services, um, starts to flow in a more meaningful way. And, um, and, and I don't care where the work gets done, like, totally. you know. You're actually, you know, I, I said em empowering the employee, but you're, you're empowering the individual. You're yeah. giving them power at the end of the day by, choosing the work that they want mm -hmm. by freeing up their time, mm -hmm. scaling them up, which is really which is really cool. What, what about from you, which is in a little bit, I wouldn't say traditional yeah. environment, but retail, for example, mm -hmm. I, I know you guys are online. Yeah. That, you know, that is a little bit more of a traditional environment. So yeah. what does that mean to you? I mean, I think that we've had our challenges when it comes to hiring, um, which we're actively working through. Maybe we need <laughs> her services. But I think for us, it's we just, I really look for subject matter experts. Right. And they're far and few between. And when I think if you find a subject matter expert, you can give them autonomy and freedom because they are active learners and they want to apply active learning to an environment. Now, for us, it's, I find it challenging to find subject matter experts. Mm -hmm. And so it's kind of how do you, Give me an example. Give me an example of something like an SME that you're looking for. So, for example, I mean, even in supply chain, you know, we have a facility right on the opposite side of the airport from here, and finding people who have enough knowledge about logistics or right. enough knowledge about um, e-commerce uh, fulfillment uh, services, apps integrations, like mostly in the digital space, I find it really hard to to find people with the applicable skills right. because unless you've started your own and then went to work for a retailer, you're not really learning in the environment that we need. So unless you already did yours, you know, and being an entrepreneur, it's, I'm not the great, greatest person to work for because I live in the clouds, right? Right. So I have to make sure that I am uh, completely a separate entity from the entire operating structure. And right. I'm also the one who's the first to make all the mistakes. So can't be trusted. Can't be trusted <laughs> in, my, in well, my own warehouse. I can't be trusted. Well, so you, I mean, Obviously, you have to hire the the, the, yeah. the best people around you. Yes. That they they are assassins. They are the yeah. subject matter experts, so yeah. that you know they can they can well, independently their passion, run. Much like I'm a subject matter expert in in my business in design and things like that. When you when you work for subject matter experts, like their passion for and desire for growth comes through, and then it builds. I find it builds that curiosity in your team where they're like, why is he so excited about shipping? Like, yeah, yeah, but yeah, I yeah. think it's just because if you're also a problem solver, right? You've got, you love what you're learning and what you're applying, but you also want to solve problems. It's like the perfect yeah. combination of a person. Now, within that, there's also 
there has to be clear deliverables, right? What are the expectations? What are the KPIs? What are the metrics by which we're both agreeing to, like this is a scorecard, and we're going to keep score according to that, right? Mm -hmm. I think where you get into issue is if you've got different expectations of what does success mean, right? Um, if everybody's on the same page that here's what we're all driving towards, and I give you the freedom to either, you know, hang yourself or run with it, um, then that's really what it's about, I think. Well, what do you think? And, and I'm, I'm going to challenge you on the scorecard a little bit, but, but, you know, empowerment. Yeah, so to me, the idea of empowerment is not necessarily ultimate freedom. Because I think if you mm. give people too much freedom, they don't actually know what direction they're going in, right? right? So for me, I think when you're leading something and you're, you're hiring a team of people to come with you along the journey, you have to make the vision really clear. Um, and that's really the job of the leader is to say, what's the vision? And not necessarily in terms of what we think the outcome is, uh, because I think then we're already kind of funneling people towards something predetermined, because the outcome might be completely different than what we expected. Um, but I think it's about what are the parameters within which we're playing and what is it that we want to be known for as a company and then let's give certain people are, that are in certain roles that have to follow compliance or whatever it might be, let's give them the freedom to change the way we do things as long as we're staying within those boundaries and then for the folks where there maybe isn't as much of a prescriptive uh, set of rules or set of compliance needs, then it's about saying, well, here are some, here's our short-term benchmarks, but then here's kind of our long-term ultimate goal yeah. and how do we get but there? But you once told me this, and it's stuck in my mind for years, or maybe months, you actually said it recently, <laughs> which is the, the line, show me the incentive and I'll show you the outcome. Yeah, that's a famous uh, quote by Charlie Munger. Okay. And he's mentioning this idea of metrics. So don't we get beholden to metrics and then because of those metrics, we're like, yeah, but we're trying to there? perform a, against those particular metrics. No, but see, again, what, what, is, what is the metric though, right? Like, it, how do you measure success? And I think that isn't necessarily what you think it might be, right? It's not create 10 widgets per hour right. per day. Okay, like so it's, 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 it's got to be something more holistic, it. right? It's got to be something that everybody can buy into. I think that's when you start, like for, for us, for example, again, just kind of making it like relevant to, to what we're talking about. In the childcare space, you know, I'm not talking to our educators about like, you know, P&L statements. I'm talking about providing a level of service that they can be proud right. of, having emotional connections with the children and the right. families. Like that to me is the metric for on the ground, on the ground level, right? If I'm talking to, you know, my director of operations, then yeah, they know that one of their metrics is P&L performance, right? So it also depends on... So you believe in, you believe in show me the outcome and I'll, or show me the incentive. So I, th I think the problem with that one though is that's about saying how people are thinking. So if you, for example, if you incentivize people only on PL outcome, then what you're going to do is you're going to get them to, at any cost, at the cost exactly. of quality and the cost of everything else you're trying to do, you'll get them to maximize and optimize the PL statement. Right, exactly. But if you say that you're incentivized based on let's say, you know, net promoter score, you're incentivized on PNL, you're incentivized on how long children stay in this, totally. in, you know, in this academy yeah. with us, then you're changing exactly. the way that you're going yeah. to get to those And that's how we look at it, is metrics are not just black and white PNL. It is buckets of different areas that we consider critically important to the su success of our business and our brand, right? And that, that's where you start to say, okay, are we all on the same page as to here's what we want to be? At the end of the day, yes, the vision could be we want to be the best, blah, 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 right? But can we get those into granular goals that are measurable in some capacity? And then how you get there right. is why I hire people that I hire in order to lead us in those ways, right? I'm not going to be able to prescribe the, 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 the recipe book because I'm not the best person to come up 100%. with those solutions. And let me piggyback off that because um, you know, today we live in a world where I, you can do way more with way less, mm -hmm. and we have all the tools and technologies around us. We've, we've made the world as seamless as possible. As an entrepreneur, as a business leader, are you, the way that you are is like, let me just double down on what I am good at. Maybe you're, you're, you're great at the vision, or maybe you're great at the creative. It's like, um, do I just double down on that and get everybody else and get the tools and technologies to do all the stuff that I don't want to do at work. Are you in that mindset already? Yeah, and I think it goes beyond the administrative. You know, I think it's about thinking 
it, how do you take your skills, but also how do you allow yourself to think about what's possible rather than trying to figure out what needs to be done? So I'm in the manufacturing business. We turn, you know, uh, surprising crops into alcohol. So we've done it with peas. We're doing it with oats. Um, and I think if I was doing this tr the traditional way, I would have you know, at some point in my life, been excited about distilling, been excited about making spirits. Right. And then I would have said, I want to be the best distiller. And then the first thing I would have done is follow, study and then follow all the other distillers, right? So what does that do automatically? Shuts down innovation. Because if you just follow the formula, you're just making right. more of the same. And it's of course incrementally better, but you're not being necessarily exponentially better or exponentially different. And then the second thing is I would have opened my own distillery. So I would have said, okay, I need to spend X million dollars with a building. I need all this equipment. I need to hire all this staff. And then every month I would have made decisions based on cash flow and fear. I would have said, okay, I have to pay rent. I have to pay my salaries and I have to pay my bank loan. So how do I get enough money coming in right. the door? And that becomes the outcome that I need. That, and so then I started thinking about those metrics. Rather, I'm able to say, look, I've outsourced the manufacturing to people who already know how to do it. Yeah. I know what I want it to taste like. I know what I want it to look like. Help me make that. And then I can challenge myself to say, what's the fastest way possible for me to get this into the hands of people who are gonna buy it over and over again? How do I grow really quickly and how do I put all of my resources into growth rather than cost reduction or cost covering? No, I love that. So I think it just changes your mindset when you're outsourcing the things that you're not good at, but also it allows you to explore possibilities that others may not have had the chance to. And, and, and you, you said you obviously you're doing this with your business, yeah. with your teams, yeah. because uh, you have to be, because you're diversified across yeah. every portfolio, but are you doing this yourself, like as a, as a human being, yeah. like trying to remove all this stuff so you could double down on what well, you were I good think at? Ideal state, I'd love to be able to do that. I think realistically though, it's still, like I run a family office, our family's capital, right? So there's never going to be a time when I'm fully removed from the day to day. You know what I mean? Like if I had the freedom to just kind of dream big and implement, you know, large scale uh, initiatives and just kind of take all these massive risks, to me, it would be a, uh, like I have to weigh it against the reality that I'm managing family assets, right? So right. with that perspective Well, I, in I mind, disagree, I think you can no, still but, do that, but well, yeah. Well, I, I think you can do both to an, to an extent, okay. right? So like there is a, there is a it's, a, it's a beta calculation at the end of the day, right? How much risk can you take relative to how much downside you're willing to accept, right? And, and that's, you know, I, I think my limit is a lot higher than most people's limits, but there's still a limit. Right. So I, you know, certainly, yes, I try to dream and be the visionary as much as possible with still a foot towards how's the day to day performance right. working, how, you know, right. how's our team focused on different initiatives? What's the actual performance looking like? You know, and, and I agree, like if we had more of an ability to outsource the things that are more cost drivers or, you know, areas of stress and pressure on a business. Like I ideal state, I think that's definitely something that would be fantastic. Now, looking at it from the perspective of legacy businesses or looking at it from the perspective of, you know, um, vertical integration and so on and so forth, those are still areas that you decide to take strategic investments in and that may or may not pay off, but at the end of the day, you're on the hook for it, right? So. So I think, you know, theoretically and empirically, there's a bit still of like a gap that needs to be recognized, right? Whereas, I, so I, I, I look at it, I, I look at it as, um, you know, if I can reduce all the administrative things around me. Administrative is different. Well, that's what I'm talking about. Yeah, I'm talking like about administrative, 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 even, even just, even just parts of your business or parts of your life that you can, yeah. like I, I, I want like. Oh yeah, administratively and like the, 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 the things that like, okay, like I don't manage my own calendar. Like I have an EA, like I don't manage, yeah. you know, I'm not scheduling and so on and so forth. Like I use our service to do subscription laundry. So I'm not doing laundry at home. Yeah. Like, you know, I, I so, so like from that perspective, I agree. Like, yeah, outsource as much as possible. But when you're talking specifically about major components of your business. No, of course, of that's course, the I get part that. Where I, I think you still need to keep your eye on the ball. So for me, like what I love is like getting, I'm a nerd when it comes to technology and tools and technology. So I try to streamline as much as possible so that I can actually spend more time wasting my time. And I'm not saying wasting like I'm watching Netflix, mm -hmm. wasting like 
oh, there's a new idea, there's a new product, there's a new technology that I can try yeah. that- But that's your job. No, I know, but I think that should be everybody's job to but figure it's not out- it's realistic. No, wait, I, think wait, wait. It is, I think it is realistic in terms of, I think when you even think about not what your job is, but what you want to spend your day doing, how do you get rid of the rest? And if you look at life right now, we're in a place where our jobs or our businesses or whatever it might be, take up a lot more time than they used to, even mental space. Then you've got your scrolling time on your phone, let's be honest, that yeah, takes up a long part of your day. But then you've got all your day-to-day -day things that you also need to do or want to do. Spend time with people that you care about. Everyone is interested in their nutrition and what they're cooking and what they're eating. But all those things have so many tasks associated with it that just take up time. And for me, I like working, but I also love spending time with the people that I care about. Oftentimes those conflict. So if I could get rid of, if I can automate or streamline or get rid of a lot of the repetitive things that I don't actually want to do, um, then I can do the things that I want. So people laugh at me because I don't use click and collect or whatever at the grocery store. They're like, why don't you just do that? You're so busy. It's easier to get someone else to pack your groceries. All you do is go pick it up or have it delivered or whatever. And for me, I actually physically like being at the grocery right. store. You, the you part I hate okay. is the meal planning and the grocery list making. Uh, those are the parts I hate. So I would automate those and use, you know, you can use Chad GPT to make your own uh, meal planning to yep. get a grocery list going. But then for me to physically go out and pick out my groceries, see what snacks I'm vibing, which ones I'm not, what fruit looks good today, what fruit doesn't look good today. I want to do that. Right. Whereas you may hate doing that. That could be the bane of your existence and you may choose to automate that part. So I think that's where I think about all the luxuries we have these days of being able to kind of weed out the stuff we don't want to do. Yeah.